The following program is rated PG-13. Parental supervision is advised. All right. Let me get my clothes on here and put my pants on. All right. Nobody's naked, right? All right. Poseidon, the ruler of the seas and all that dwell within them. His rule over the oceans is unquestioned. There are those who serve him with tridents and with infinite knowledge of all things submarine. They are known by many names. Coners. Weaponeers. The Merry Men of Sherwood Forest. But by Poseidon himself, they are called the Subvets. Stand battle stations missile for WSRT. Spin up all missiles. And on July 7, 1948, something went horribly wrong. The Cusk had a balloon that was launched, and the rocket sled assembly it exploded. The missile rolled as it went off the launcher, and it dove down and hit on the after deck of the submarine. It covered the submarine and with flame and fire. In front of horrified onlookers, the burning USS Cusk disappeared below the surface. The ships in the area immediately reported that the Cusk had sunk. Fortunately, they were mistaken. As soon as the skipper realized what had happened, why he checked to make sure that there was no hull rupture, and since the pressure was still holding, all they had to do was dive, and they had all the water they needed to put out the fire. That condition 1SQ for WSRT. Spin up missiles three, six, and nine for weapon system readiness test. What the hell are you doing three, six, and nine for? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> A little inside baseball here. This is like the fifth take we've done of this opening. And every take, it's been spin up all missiles. Now all of a sudden, it's three, six, and nine. What, did, you, did you decode the message differently this time? or? Yeah, that was just, I sort of felt like doing this time. I just kind of threw that on there. So, you know. Yeah. All, all the other missiles are out of commission, so that's why it's three, six, and nine. Well, why aren't you missile techs get off your butts and get those missile tubes in 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 condition? Do you have any idea how many hydraulic leaks we got back there, James? <laughs> I mean, I know you're on those fancy Ohio classes, but you know everything just worked perfectly, right? <laughs> that was the beauty of the Tridents is that everything worked just great and dandy all the like time. A, you guys just racking it out, yeah. watching movies. It's like those EPM clutches, they they always work mm. perfectly all the time. Uh-huh. I think it ran itself too. You didn't even have to stand yeah. watches, but once a day, right? We had. I, mean, I don't know if you guys had this or not. Yeah, we had the Ships Control Application Program SCAP. I remember SCAP. Okay, now so the the idea of SCAP for you older guys, you know what we talk. This is for the nubs and the the people that aren't qualified. So relax. Don't send me your email saying Jamie because you it can't be. I know you know. <laughs> This is for the people who don't know. So it was like autopilot, right? And the idea here was you could program in course, speed, depth, and, and the ship would just drive itself. Yeah. Until the day it doesn't. <laughs> We're sitting, I'm sitting in Missile Control Center, and you hear the radio the, on the 7MC, because we got the monitor box in there. Con radio buoy in 10 feet. Radio con I. On radio, buoy in ten feet. Radio con I. Con radio, buoy in ten feet. In ten feet. On radio I. A boom. Remember that sound you talked about when the fair water plant hit the water? Yeah. So instead of being at patrol depth, which is where the ship's control application program thought we were we was on the surface yeah so, and uh captain so you heard the buoy smack yeah <laughs> conway was captain conway was not happy he went around the ship after that and taped over every digital depth gauge on the ship including the one in mcc and i'm like sir w- w- why here i mean i don't have any control over how deep we are and captain conway Frank Mark Conway the third, later Admiral, looked at me and said, Bowman, do you want to know how deep we are? Occasionally, sir. 
And he said, then go read the analog gauge. Said, aye, aye, sir. <laughs> that was it for yeah, I'm tr- yeah, yeah, So the digital gauges, I mean, on the old Lafayette, I don't know, it was 628, 616. I don't, but the swords, I know, were they came off the bottom of the mystical apartment forward. And that was the thing that's sticking out in the water monitor depth. I think I, I, I seem to remember the technical term swords. I could be wrong. But. It was a long so, time ago, man. Long time ago, yeah. So long. So I know it was, a, I think that was the digital reference, and we had to check it just to make sure it matched up with the analog reference. Or I'm um, that might be backwards. I'm embarrassed to say I have no idea where it was. Yeah, but I remember that was one of the one of our duties, if I remember right, on the grant. The Stimson was a newer class. Not really. Don't really remember having to check it on that one. I, haven't, I, I, I used to be able to say I haven't seen my submarine since 1987, but that's no longer true because I did see it in the dry dock down here in Bremerton. So I haven't seen my, but I haven't been on my submarine since 1987, so I can't remember squat. Well, I mean, you talked to a guy that sleeps in your rack. I did do that. That was weird. I mean, yeah. <laughs> How often does that happen? Not very Never. often. Not very often, but yeah, that's these kids today, man. It's different Navy, different Navy. Speaking of getting old, I mean, this this whole joints falling apart and surgeries and you know, steroid shots. I don't know what it's doctors always, you know, you tell them, you say, you know, hey, doc, when I get steroid shots and knees, which I need, I need about once a year to six months, and it's you know, it's. I guess like the syringes you would see for, uh, I don't know, like squirting out your ear. A little, not, not a real big syringe, but, you know, a fat syringe. They put this milky white substance in there, which is a steroid and some substrate of who knows what else. It might be brake fluid in there for all I don't know. But, you know, they squirt that a lot of it into your knee, not more, I, more than you would think. You know, you think just like a regular shop. No, they're putting a bunch of ju- juice in your knee. and prefer- That's alarming to begin with. But for me... It causes me a lot of, I don't know, a lot of, I, I would say, upset, pain. What else does it do? Until it's, is it, But when it, I, when it kicks in, I mean, it works fantastic. The pain in the knee goes away. I get six months to a year, but, you know, it makes it six. I kind of I kind of uh, take it to like a pool, pool chemicals. Like if you're down in Florida, you know, if you pool company, you know, you got to maintain your chemicals at a certain thing or things get a whack. You get get the fungus in there algae and stuff but every time i get one of these things i suffer for a week so is that and i'm done i'm done complaining now dave is that, cortisone? <laughs> is that cortisone or is that something else it might be cortisone i know it's it, it could be i asked him i said what's because i get steroids on, on other parts of my body like in the back and stuff no problem at all with it there oh i have migraine headaches one of the biggest ones hmm. and, and you know the doctor's like i, I never heard of anybody you know, have complaining like like you. Everybody else, you know, they're just good to go. And I'm starting to wonder what do doctors know. I mean, I per- I figure they all practice medicine on you know Google now. I mean, I can do that. You know, you're you go to the hospital, you just see them with those iPads in front of them. Patient says this, and they put in a complaint, and there you go. And they just tell them what mine. to do. Yeah, I just put steroid. Mine. Yeah, put put a syringe of milky white substance in their knee. <laughs> Ignore patient when he complains, especially if his name is former Petty Officer Ryle. Kick him out of the VA. <laughs> Ran into another submariner, by the way, there. Yeah. Uh, Von Steuben. I don't know, but, it, you know, he was, you know, he saw my hat and he says, yeah, I was a submarine, but I was going to try to, you know, want to record and say, hey, do you want to talk about it? And he just didn't seem like he was too talkative after he approached me and he just on his way out. But, you know. Man, I'd like, like we said before in the last podcast, I'd really like to record some stories, you know, when we can. When we, and you can, we uh, you can give us a call, leave us a voicemail or a text at 360-930-9556. And we'd love to hear from you about what you think and maybe mm-hmm. set up a time for you to come on and share your sea stories and all that kind of stuff, too. I've had so many cortisone shots in my knee. It, uh, man, I, I don't know. And, and, the thing was when I first, when I got my first one, it lasted like a year. Uh-huh. Then the second one was like eight months. And then the third one was like six months. And then the fourth one was like three months. <laughs> and it just uh, declined. Yeah, the, right, the right knee was the same thing. But, right. uh, yeah. Oh, it so declines a, over time. Right. So we had to do a triper 
on my right knee, you know, replace the part, try and in, pl- in place replacement. <laughs> so is that good? Yeah, because they're, they're, they're wanting to do a full replacement on mama, but because of uh, the ongoing pandemic and the craziness that's been put off till who knows when. Hmm. So I'm going to bother them some more about it. I'm trying to get it done through uh, my wife's work to, you know, use UC Health as well as see if I can get that done. The good people over there at UC Health. I like, you know, I, like, I see a doctor over there and I, I really like like those guys over there. They do a great job. So. Well, that's good. So, how was your uh, how was your holiday and New Year's? Everything go, everything go, went good. Everything you know, there, there was no disasters or craziness. You know, of a uh, smaller you know gathering of family, just the local family here in this that area. That was Nobody a small in. gathering. Wait, wait. That, that, that was both flew in. No, we well, normally we have because so my for people who don't know my what my wife is Peruvian, and we have a Peruvian family, but. Peruvians, I, and I'm getting to think it's all South Americans, but definitely Peruvian. There's a large Peruvian population here in, in Denver. And when they meet each other, you're, it's just instantly like the blood fam, family. So, you know, what? what I, I, you saw some of the parties we had over last summer and stuff, you know, the dance and stuff. People just come out of the blow, you know, out of the, uh, what's the word for it? Out of the, thin air. Dave, I'm out of less work. <laughs> they Anyways, come out of thin air. They're thin air, then they just come and there's this proof, you know. And the proven people, great people. I mean, I, I love it, love the food, I love the karamet. You know, that reminds me of uh, when I was growing up in the south, how family used to be. I think it's like a lost thing on the American population for the for those that grow up as regular old Americans. But you know, there's something to be said about the, you know how, how those people treat each other and. No, it, was, it was a great about, holiday. How about he's you? Talking about this small, he's talking about this small gathering that he had. I'm watching the video going, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, stuff on Facebook, big pictures. Yeah, my wife works New Year's Eve, so my New Year's Eve was just me sitting here with my son. My son wanted to stay up till midnight. I don't know why, he just did. So we played chess for like three hours. Waiting but who for- won? Well, I did, of course. You don't think I'm going to let him win. See, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that let your kid win to make him feel good and their their self-esteem. Screw that. You want to beat me, bud? You work at it. And that way, when you do finally win, you feel like you've accomplished something. And then I can sign off on your call card, defeated me in chess. (laughs) And how's that going to make you feel when it happens? Me? Yeah. Well, being as I'm not a grandmaster... and I make plenty of mistakes. I don't think it'll bother me that much because I, I do have a pretty smart kid. But because yeah, yeah, I'm. But I do I, like I, how I it frustrates. Him. I, I kind of enjoy how it frustrates him. But <laughs> so you're not going to be defeated. No, I will not. Yeah. Be. Speaking of uh, submarine news, you ready for World War Three? Absolutely. You know that's your train thing's been brewing for a while. So we got that hot spot in Korea. They Kim Jong. Little guy, yeah, says that he fired off a hypersonic missile. Although, from what I hear, it was less hyper or sonic and just sort of a missile, kind of like just a bad bottle rocket went awry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't seen all the details on the test, but from what I hear about the test, it did not, uh, it did not demonstrate any of the qualities you're looking for in a hypersonic missile. Now, I think that did get a lot of people's attention over there, though, like it always does. Yeah, Guam I was watching, What was I watching this morning? I was watching a, there's a documentary on Prime Video called Regulus. And it talks about the Regulus missile and right. predecessor, the Loon. And I guess it was Cusk. I think it was Cusk. They had a, they were trying to shoot a Loon missile off the deck. See, this is, they, these guys back then, man, <laughs> they were, they were crazy. Okay. So they yeah. used this rocket sled to push the missile off the deck, right? Right. The missile was fine. The rocket sled didn't work. The rocket sled just blew up. They pushed fire and it blew up. Mm -hmm. So the missile, which is full of liquid fuel, spills onto the deck of the the submarine. Sweet. The whole thing's on fire, right? All the observation ships are having a, uh, you know, they're, they're, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And as the smoke clears, they realize that the submarine isn't there anymore. So they start reporting sub sank, right? (laughs) Well, it right. turns out that the captain of the submarine, because all captains of submarines are smarter than skimmers anyway. Oh, boy. <laughs> realized realized very quickly that his submarine topside was on fire. Fire. 
So what, he did what do you put fire out with, Dave? Water. So he did what every submariner <laughs> would do. He went, he went flood naked into the Mark Emergency Deep and took the boat down, put the fire out. But man, just this whole concept of this missile, was it Tennessee? Was it, who was it that launched the first D5? I think it was Tennessee. It was Tennessee, yeah. Right, the with D5 that, with that, that, with yeah, that spiral. The, yeah. Oh my God, I can't even. I, mm, launching four C4s regularly was loud enough. I can't even imagine. There, there was a big size difference between the C4 and the, and the, you know, the D5. Yeah. And that's what caused that issue. I mean, it was, so obviously the Trident was built in mind to, I don't know, they call all submarines, you know, the first missiles were smaller than, right? So they accommodate newer systems as it goes down. And how, I mean, how many years have we been with, uh, how cost 40 years? But they built those, they built those intentionally to handle the D5. They were they were equipped. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, when they were built, they were built for the D five missile, but they didn't have the D five missile yet, so they had to use the C four. So yeah. we had, if you if you went on Michigan where I was, you know the, the the lower level missile compartment was empty. I mean, it was just a void void in there. Yeah, the tube was, stand up in there. I've never right. been under they it. Had, and that they had. It, Stuff inside the tube to make it smaller so that the C4 would fit and, and stuff right. like that. So yeah, it was it was designed for the for the for the D5 missile. But they just didn't have it yet. And it wasn't until Tennessee came along that they had they finally had it. And I can't imagine the first time you fire one. Yeah, that didn't go well. So I know the details is I I would have yeah, you know, I don't want to say nothing because I'd have to make sure it's not classified, but I do know why that thing spun out of control. And it was an interesting fix to to make that not happen again, but it had something to do with how big that missile was. You can figure it out from there, but I'm not going to say what the fix was, but you know, speaking of that, since we're bringing up rockets and this is a cool thing to talk about. So we see SpaceX in the news quite a bit. And what's he doing as he's developing starship and well, any, any of his rockets he's had so far. I mean, he launches those things up when they're in test and he just blows them up and left to right. So, you know, and, and, and people, well, a lot of the other rocket programs out there, like Lock, Lockheed Martin, United Space Alliance, these guys give them a lot of grief for that. But, you know, they got two different philosophies and they give them grief. And but you talk to the old guys when I was stationed in O2 out there at Cape Canaveral, you know, they you know, they talk about the good old days in the 50s and 60s when they were testing all these different rockets. I mean, all kinds of different rockets. So many rockets, I don't even remember the names of all of them. I think Juno was a, was the Army Juno was a predecessor to our missile systems, you know, that eventually come at FBM and uh, Polaris. But he said there was rockets just flying everywhere on Cape Canaveral. People just ducking and blowing up everywhere. You know, the destruct systems were, you know, they, were, they weren't up to par yet maybe the first ones didn't even have destruct systems there wasn't probably as many people living out there on Merritt island at the time you know in the east coast you know thank god you know probably take out a few trailer parks but yeah it's, so that, that's how you know they were able to innovate so quickly and then you know going in you know going into the apollo program we were we were moving i mean we went from sending things everywhere which way and direction you know, blowing things up to putting a man on the moon by the end of the 60s. And then everything just stopped. And well, then, it was expensive, man. It was, it was a lot of reasons. I know the space shuttle was pretty much already a thing with Nixon. I think he was the one that it kind of proved this is where this is the direction you're going. I mean, then we can go with my conspiracy stuff, you know, like there's aliens up on the moon and stuff like that. I mean, that's always my, my thing. But you know, we were told not to come back. But no, growing up in Aaron, you would have you would have remembered this. I mean, when you were growing up, days is laughing. But when we were growing up, we were going we were going out to space. We were going to Mars. I mean, especially because my dad worked at the NASA at the time, growing up in uh, Central Florida. And every restaurant you went, there was a space theme this and space theme that. You know, it was it was good times, and we really thought that the Jetsons was going to happen by the year two thousand. And all we got was the internet and AOL. And then they give poor old uh, Elon Musk a bunch of grief for blowing his rockets up, innovating, and look what he's doing. So um, I give uh, I give Elon Musk uh, A plus for what he's doing. A plus plus. All right. So you want a conspiracy theory here? <laughs> Wait, okay. <laughs> when, when, 
the Jetsons. You thought we were going to have the Jetsons. But when did the Jetsons take place? Oh, man. Do you see, it's you with these oolies. See, this would be a good thing when you're on watch. You know, you're like in your right. fifth hour, five hours, and I don't know, 28 minutes in, and somebody asks this question. Okay, so here's now, the other question. When, <laughs> when does the Flintstones take place? All right. 60s late 50s no i don't mean that i mean when is the show set oh the actual yeah i was thinking about the year okay now the year jetsons are set when in the future right 2005 okay when is the flintstones set um 10,000 bc or something something like that yeah and yet there exists eric an actual show where the two families meet in person of course, it, of course that happens. So what if both of them are just living in some post-apocalyptic fantasy world somewhere? Because uh-huh. the earth been the earth has been destroyed, the skies have been scorched or whatever, Skynet's taken over. Uh-huh. So they're just living in these pretend environments to to deal with their realities. And the Jetsons futuristic never really never really will be because it's just their imagination and the flintstones living in 10,000 bc with movie theaters and televisions and radios and all that's just uh the stuff of mid-watch discussion fodder as well and then what if history's been erased multiple times Maybe, you know, globalists, they start to lose control. There's too many people and they started to blow everybody up. Rewrite history within a span of a, a couple of generations and, and uh, you lose uh, a thousand years and you call it the dark ages. Okay, so and how many you put of these conversations? Char- charge all this stuff. I got conspiracies all day. But <laughs> My question is, how many of these kinds of conversations did you have on the Midwatch? You know, with, with I mean, some like, of the most twisted conversations you've ever heard. Steve Brock, uh, is a, <laughs> he, 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 Brock is a sub vet out in South Carolina, Aiken, South Carolina. He's written a book called Bubbleheads the Book. In mm-hmm. fact, I have a copy of it right here. Um, yeah, I got a that's, copy of his book that's, too. Was, that's how his there's a whole chapter in his book about midwatch conversations, Ginger or Marianne. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, I've had that conversation. I've stood in Missile yeah. Control Center and had that very conversation. I've stood other places and had that very conversation too. But but I've had some strange midwatch conversations, some of which I can't even get into because they were about things that were relevant to us. And hmm. You think there's a Victor Three out there listening? What's that now? Yeah, think there's a Victor Three out there listening? Of course there is. Then we should be quiet. <laughs> yeah, but apologize for my dog barking in the background. Apologize Who knows for my what kids they... running up down the stairs yelling. What? <laughs> it's life, man. Yeah, it just that's yeah, life rolling. So let's uh, let's talk some submarine news. You ready? Yeah, go. All right. Shoot. Last week we had a British. Frigate destroyer. I'm not clear on what it was. A British surface ship hit a Russian submarine. Now, did that happen a while ago, or did that just no, it recently happened, happen? It happened. It happened like the tenth. We we already had this conversation because we, this is right the, because the yeah because the written initial articles were confusing, and then I read it and said, "Oh, it just happened." They're only confusing because <laughs> people don't know how to read dates. See, here in America, we put the, the month, then the day, then the year. Everywhere else in the world puts the, the, the day, then the month, then the year. And right. so that was confusing. People are like, well, let's up and That's what happened. I'm like, for the love of God. It's like the metric system, you know. So does that count for finding the submarine? Or is that just like lucky fishing? Like you, you drug a lure and you just okay. so you got a dead question, fish or do you, something. Do you think it's really an accident? No, so this, this is where I get into the conspiracy. There. So, if a submarine, Russian submarine, kind of blunders into your path, and you, do you kind of, do you kind of kick it a little bit, or because, because you're not going to get. See, there's no way this guy gets relieved. They don't relieve this guy for a collision like they would, you know, here in America. They would, 
promote you. Oh, no, he's getting a medal. Right. He's going to get a medal, medal accommodation, all that kind of stuff. He's going to get congratulations and all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm just wondering if it was really an accident, kind of like the Baton Rouge and the the Russian submarine a few years ago, 92, whenever that was. I'm I'm not convinced that that's really an accident, but that's just my opinion. So I don't know. Um, Who was it? Uh, Sub brief. Is that Aaron? Yeah, it's Aaron. So is it, uh, he thinks it was K-335, said it completed in 80, it was the only Northern Fleet submarine to complete a deployment in 2020. So he thinks that, based on that, he thinks that was her. But I don't know. Did did you you see, see, I mean, uh, we can can talk about it, but did you see the other article that says, you know, uh, uh, the NATO and allies are scared because uh, they deployed the black hole, the Russian submarine, the black hole. That's what they're calling it, the black hole? Is yeah, because so, it was yeah, it makes no sound. It's a, a black hole. <laughs> the story is there's a missing Russian submarine in the Mediterranean. Right. But is it missing or is it just hiding? And the reaction seems to be that TASS, the Soviet news agency TASS, is acting like we think it's missing. Whereas there, when I read the article, it was like they were it was like they were thumbing their noses at me, 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 me. You can't find us. Mm. Like, well, I don't know about that, but when you when uh when western press picks up on these things they're always like uh you know nato's terrified you know like yeah. we got we got we got the uh, you know naval officers out there and joint chiefs of staff out there quaking in their boots you know uh, what we can't find this boat what are we gonna do <laughs> yeah i'm not sure this works the way they think it works <laughs> i'm like wait anyway it, the, the reaction, the, the, the news story from TASS is hysterical because it, it does seem to get that impression like, but, but then there are bits in that story where they're acting like it's, it's, remember the scene in uh, Hunt for Red October where the Soviet ambassador has to go talk to the defense guy and he's like, so we've lost a submarine. Yeah. <laughs> and the defense secretary is like, oh, okay. Another one? Do you want us to help you look for it? <laughs> no, another one. It's a great scene, but uh, it's just, I don't know, man. They, there's hints in that story that maybe they lost one, and then there's hints in that story that, which makes me think that's because it's from coming from TASS. And for those of you who aren't old enough to remember TASS, basically, if the Soviet news agency TASS reported something, you knew that it wasn't true. You just sort of blew it off, and you know, Soviet news agency TASS reported that three Russian cosmonauts landed on the moon last night. Right. No, they didn't. I, so, I find it interesting where, you know, well, I mean, this is going to come up where we're getting right. We're going to talk about the USS San Francisco, but uh, I find it interesting how we approach our news about, you know, some of our submarines in other countries and they, they tend to brag. Russia tends to brag a lot, whether any of that's in, in China. Another one like India, when they commission a, a submarine, I mean, it's like the huge, it's like world party, New Year's Eve type stuff when they commission a submarine. When we do stuff, I mean, we release something, but it's pretty quiet. You, you don't even know where to go to see the commissioning ceremony or the christening ceremony. You know, somebody, you know, is family with the crew project. Like, but, you know, other nations, they approach it. And I, who, who knows, you know, what's the reason behind that? It's all propaganda to some point. So COVID, man, that's why we don't know anything. COVID <laughs> might get COVID if you see a submarine commissioned here. Right. Nobody else seems to care. Yeah, it was uh it, it was a sober anniversary talking about the San Francisco. Now I was not in the Navy when that happened. In fact, I was just, as I recall, just starting my radio career, or right about to start my radio career when that happened. And I remember passing news stories Mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of reporting where i was in central california about it and so it took it took weeks if not months to find out any information about it at all but that was not the case for you no it's uh so i call it web 2.0 now the internet's changed a lot since you know back in the 90s where we had all the dialed up we talked about this before aol prodigy and that kind of stuff and so as you got into the 2000s, this is pre-social media. So 2005, I'm thinking MySpace was around and popular. It's hard to, 
there's there's a lot of people that are adults now. They're like, what's MySpace? That was the big thing before Facebook. So social media wasn't really a big thing. So so it's funny. I always say how things have gone. I call Web 1.0 to 2.0, and, and I'm 2.0 for me is because everything everything's geared to be on a cell phone. And you, when you see most people walking around. They're on their cell phones constantly. That's how the people connect to the internet, and because of social media, it's how they t- you know communicate with the internet. It's very rarely do people get and sit down in front of a computer anymore, you know, like we're doing right now. So that's that's why I call it two point And plus, with the social media, it's kind of controlled. So back, you know, when when web the web internet started getting uh, popular, every, you know, everybody was anonymous. So everybody had an anonymous name, AOL, and and uh, there was message boards out there. People used to visit message boards and stuff. And as uh, people started to get off of AOL, but even on the message boards, everybody was anonymous. So as blogging came along, which is right around the time with uh, the San Fran Axe, and I could be off. I mean, it was like a big deal to kind of step out and say, here's the name of my blog. Here's my name. And here's where I served and a little bit about me. And there's a, wasn't a lot of submariners doing it. So, and one of the first, and, you know, probably the most uh, celebrated blogging submariner, they got it all started for us as far as, you know, outside of the official Navy was uh, Joel Kennedy with the stupid shall be punished. And he started just right prior to the accident. And um, I I think, you know, I saw his blog and I, there was a few others at the time. So we all kind of started around the same time. And me, I, I kind of started my Drudge Report type style. This was my first attempt at, you know, doing media, doing some HTML action sandbox. And, you know, I taught myself code so I can build a website similar to the Drudge, but it was nothing but submarine news. And it was called the subreport.com. So we caught wind of this. I don't. I can't even remember who caught it first. I don't think I did, but we all pinged up each other relatively pretty quickly. And I remember I had auto CSS feeds, you know, so people's stories and pictures would automatically kind of feed into to my blog at the time. So, and I I had been talking to um, somebody at Compsubland, I think it was, but. And I got an email, right? I'm like, hey, you know, because when after it happened, this was January night that happened. And I'm trying to remember how many, it was just a few days, but we got the pictures pretty quick. So digital cameras were still pretty expensive. And the quality of digital cameras wasn't wasn't that great. So some of the first pictures that were taken of the accident after they pulled into dry dot, and which was you know several days later after they pulled in from Guam. I mean, somebody that was a pretty good camera. No, you know, people that you were able to take a picture on a cell phone back then, but I mean, very grainy, you know, it was a flip phone and you take a picture. It wasn't the same. So it's like, who took the pictures of it? It got on the web. All we did was cross post it and, you know, we put it on there, but, you know, security got away from us a little bit and they were right. So we, we took them down. And of course, all those pictures are out there on the internet. All the ones that, you know, the Navy got upset with us are all out there now, but. It was it was really interesting how we we all acted like we were professional news press, you know, all the submarine bloggers, you know, who's getting this and who got that. It, and it was really fun because we're trying to see who could break what first. You know, somebody knew somebody that was, you know, either a shipmate or somebody on the boat or, or, you know, or, you know, was on the boat before or had contacts or something. But, you know, so we get little bits and pieces of information in right away. So. It's uh, interesting. So the, the best story I could find, the real story, because so the initial stories, which uh, Joel Kennedy had the best ones, and he had the rumor mill. They were off of uh, some message boards, like I was saying before. Um, the two popular ones back then was freerepublic.com and uh, Democratic Underground, which I don't know if either one of them are still around. Because, you know, nobody, nobody really messes with that kind of stuff anymore. Everything's Facebook and Twitter. I know, I know so, Ron Martini out in Sheridan, Wyoming had the, what was it oh called? Oh, yeah, the Ron Martini BBS. Yeah, Ron, what, it, what was his called? His was called Submarine BBS. He had a lot of that earlier stuff, too. Uh, and, and for the record, Joel's website, the, uh, the, the, the actual blog, 
mm-hmm. is still there. You just got to know where to find it. Right. And I'm, I'm actually looking at his first couple of San Francisco posts and with some of this stuff is, uh, it's, it's, yeah, chronologically, yeah. you know, yeah, he kind of throws it down as it was happening over the days. And you'd be, you know, like if, if that kind of, well, we had it recently with the USS Connecticut, which uh, Joel Kennedy, I think that's one of his boats, matter of fact, USS yep. Connecticut. But, you know, something like that happened today, you know, somebody's going to be called a task. And I, I would think they would call you a task even if you was out in the Navy. <laughs> kind of the stuff that we did, you know, because things are a, a lot more tightly controlled because, Nobody's anonymous anymore. You know, Facebook and Twitter, you have to verify your identification on there and all that kind of stuff. So that was kind of the, what, what Web 1.0 was. It, was. it was more free. There was more information out there. Information, I believe, uh, went more freely than now. Um, I think you had to know a little bit more about the Internet, and how to find information. But there was a lot more information to be had if you're willing to dig for it. And now the web's more controlled and it's harder to dig for information like that. I mean, even the Navy's real type, they, they rarely release photos of submarines anymore. Not like they did back then. Heck, I can find a new submarine photo almost every day. But yeah, if you go to uh, bubbleheads.blogspot.com and click on, I think, December 2004 and go to the very bottom, you to scroll to the bottom and you can kind of go chronologically how this all broke, broke down. And then the best account is on navsource.org. Go to the San Francisco's page on there. And there's a there's a guy that was, was apparently he was he emailed this the story away. He was the diving officer. Doesn't name him, I don't think. And kind of, you know, really gives a play-by-play how it happened, how they went. So they were at flank speed. And they said when they hit, and so it was during meal, meal hour, is what I said. And and when it when it hit, they went from Closest playing speed to four knots, just like that. So you remember, you got no reference on a submarine, Dave, as you realize. You got like, no windows. And so you're in one position one second, and you're going in another position just like that. A lot Lost of injuries. to be gained, minus 26 <laughs> knots. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to know what flank speed is on a fast attack. Don't really care. Just be on, but you know, flanks fast and going to four knots is that's that's quick. And how and there was one death on there, uh, Petty Officer uh, Joseph Ashley. It was MM2. I don't remember if he was a nuke or regular A gang or that doesn't really matter. But to, to, to how they only had one death, death, you know, at you know, everybody hitting that forward. I mean, think of think about I don't know how they were situated on the Ohio class, because we slept on you know swimming cushions in the outboards of the missile compartment. That's all because you guys were mean. You didn't like us, no two guys. But on the old boats, a lot of people slept with their head forward. So think about if you hit something, you know, how many injuries, different injuries, neck injuries, and people could have more people could have died. I don't know. It's crazy. I've always looked at it as it was a miracle that they survived when I saw the pictures and I probably didn't see them until, I don't know, February, March of 2005. I was shocked. I mean, I, I looked at that and went, I don't know how they survived. I really don't. I, it, it just looks so bad. And <clears throat> for all the complaining we do about yard work and yard birds, mm-hmm. Boy, they did that one right, didn't they? They did it right. A lot of the quick thinking of the chief who will watch, who got slammed into the ballast control panel hard, broke his arm, and still was able to, you know, he probably sh- saved the ship because he threw the chicken switches and got them to the surface. Without an order? Without an order. Yeah. I mean, at that point, are you asking? No, <laughs> I'm not either, man. No. <laughs> Maybe that's, you know, put into us from a uh, sub school, you know, <laughs> just hit, hit those babies and blow and go. Yeah. Boy, if I'm anywhere else, I mean, I'm doing everything I can to get there to throw them. Cause that's, yeah. Mm. At some point that's, uh, that's really your only chance, mm. but with so, that much devastation, with that much of the forward ship ballast tanks destroyed and he wouldn't have known that he would have no way of knowing that. 
Right. So I'm wondering, you know, I wasn't there, obviously. I'm wondering how that thing would have come up kind of stern first. Do they? Yeah. And I don't know how compromise. I know the, the two of the MBTs were comp- compromised, I mean, ballast tanks. They said they, they had to use a, uh, you know, the air compressor, which was marginally working anyways. They had to run it for 30 or 36 hours until they got in with a, you know, full put pressure blow on it going all the, the whole way, practically. Or a charging blow, I guess it would be. So if it was too compromised, a charging blow wouldn't work. But it was enough to keep them surfaced until they can get some help. And The testament to the training and the construction of these boats, and it's a testament to, in many ways, you know, we don't talk about this as much as we used to. It's, it, in many ways, it's a testament to the silence of the silent service. Right. That it took a long time for this story to come out. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because I got two hats here. One, and I'm not wearing any hats. I realize that if you're watching the video, but one is my submarine hat. I'm a submariner. Right. And so I have a certain attitude, belief, thought process here. But I'm also media. And I'm also in, in, in dealing with media and dealing with people in a way that I think these stories like this should be told. And they should be told in all of their details, as long as you're not into classified information, because I I think people need to know how dangerous this is because it's, we're getting ready to face a situation. Maybe we'll talk about this here in a little, in a a little bit, we're going to send our kids, our our, our boys and girls into harm's way. Mm -hmm. And we, as a people need to know that the equipment that we're sending them with is top notch. And the way you tell them that it's top notch is you tell them what happened to the San Francisco. You tell them what's it's driving me nuts. The way the Navy has clamped down on the, on the Connecticut people need to know how, how well that submarine survived because we're getting ready to say to our kids, go into harm's way on this equipment with, with the people of the United States, not necessarily knowing how good that equipment is. For God's sakes, we sent submarines to war in World War II for two years with torpedoes that didn't work. Imagine that. Didn't tell anybody. It's I, I, So I'm, I'm kind of of mixed feelings about it, Eric. I, I have the two hats. I understand the unwillingness to talk about it. But at the same time, my other job, my other career, my post-Navy mm-hmm. career, I, I, I think these are stories that people would want to hear. I really do. And uh, what... With the USS San Francisco, it's a good thing because with the multiple sources, and some of it might be hearsay, but, you know, between Joel's blog and and that great article on the app source, I mean, it really gives you a a good idea of what happened. I'm sure there's some classified stuff that happened, but prior to that, in the Cold War, there was lots of collisions, a lot of monkey business went on, but the Navy kept well controlled of it. You only heard, except for the Baton Rouge, and, oh, we had that. What was the boat I was telling you about the last uh, podcast we did with? I met that guy at the VA. He was on a, a boat that was in a collision. Oh, yeah. The the one that, yeah. I, I can't remember now. Yeah. I can't, Tau-tog. Yeah, Tau-tog. It's case me. Well, maybe we'll, we can put it under the store or something. Isn't it Tau-tog? Tau-tog. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, other other than, you know, probably USS VI meetings and closed door type things like that where we let things because we're all submariners will tell stories that no, normally get documented the navy maintained you know opsec on on the submarine force all the way until you know the internet came out internet's what you know caused the problem so web 1.0 I, was a big problem for the navy to contain not just for submarines but the, the whole military you know things like i said was if you really wanted to dig you could find information because in the year 2000, that's basically when the big push was like, all right, get all your documentation. We're going all internet based. It reproved it works. And everybody started scanning all their documentation and put it online. So, how many mistakes were made? You know, how much reactor information probably got out there by accident? And then the Russians probably got it, you know? And, and now, you know, I, have to think, I would like to think a lot of things are clamped down. I mean, we see with the recent politics and everything's going on in our own country internally and great show, by the way, Dave Bowen show. That was a great, good show. You should go listen to that about, you know, uh, Ukraine and you know, how history kind of repeats itself, but you know, security. It does. 
And that's what, that's what worries me. I mean, look, we got all these hot spots in the, in the world right now, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, North Korea, Taiwan, and they all seem disconnected, but, but there's an underlying theme of opportunity here. And I'm going to say this because it's something that I truly believe. And that is war is an irrational act. It is an act, particularly in the modern era, say since right. 1900 on war is an irrational act. It is almost always started by irrational people. And the proof of their irrationality is that they think they can win and they never do. So if you go through every major war since 1900, 90% plus of the time, the person, the, the, the entity, the person and or nation that started the war loses and loses badly. But they go into it with this attitude of the other side is showing weakness. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait because he doesn't believe that anybody will do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And until he's dangling at the end of a rope, he probably still believed that. Germany twice starts world wars, believing that they can win them quickly and, and so forth and so on. And then you have, you know, the so on and so forth. It's an irrational act carried out by irrational people. And so it's almost impossible to predict what somebody's going to do. When you look at somebody like Kim Jong-un, what does he see when he looks around right now? He's firing off what he claims are hypersonic missiles, but are they? I don't know. But he thinks he thinks that you'll believe him when he say that they are. China has, has made it very clear that they're going to move on Taiwan. It's just a matter of when. Ukraine. I don't know if you've been following the tweets today. Today, as we record this, is the 12th of December. Sorry, 12th of January. Let's jump back a month. If you follow the Twitter news out of out of uh, Ukraine today, out of Europe today, my God, man, it's like it's like Austria Hungary has issued their ultimatum to Serbia again, and Serbia has told them to blow it out their butts, and that's where we're at. I mean. We're, the ultimatum that Russia, that Putin gave the West has been rejected. And, and the West has come back with, I'm not making this up, Eric. They've come back with, let's expand NATO into Lithuania and Latvia. So. And uh, while the previous administration was charged, we kind of backed out of that, you know, you know, you got all the politics with that. So we just save in face, but you know, it, the, you, the recurring, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest, but it's all these people that just can't, seem to get along and they're wielding their people against each other like you were saying with world war one and then moving to denver and and i think you said san francisco's like all the different nationalities are here in denver and you get to meet them and some of them were my former in enemies that i was told that would kill me and slash my throat in two seconds if they saw me turn out to be the nicest people ever and like i was telling we beginning the show with the peruvians i mean a lot i've met a lot of russians since i've been here hey, david they're just like everybody else. They just want to support a family, raise a family, want to meet good people. But, you know, these governments and these power brokers and name them whatever you want. You know, they just think, uh, you know, we as countries, we need to go at it with each other for whatever reason. One of the most surreal experiences of my life. I got out of the Navy in 91 at the close of the first Gulf War. I got out. Um I have some Gulf War stories I could tell you, but they're not really applicable to this, and they don't have anything to do with submarines. Um, I got out at the end of the at the end of the Gulf War. Five years later, I was a Salvation Army Corps officer at a unit in Atlanta, Georgia, just outside on the east side of Atlanta, and I was the Olympics were going on. It's 1996, and so the Salvation Army has these what they call mission teams. You know, you know what, if you're at all familiar with the church, you know what a mission team is. Right. So these mission teams come from all over the world to Atlanta to do whatever it is they're going to do during the Olympics. Cause I, I, I guess they're going to save the world for Jesus at the Olympics. I don't know. Well, one of the teams that we have <laughs> comes from Russia and it gets assigned to my unit. My unit is their base. You're like, Oh boy. <laughs> like, Oh, that's uh, well, it gets even better because my, my brother actually ends up marrying one of them. So anyway, that that's another story for another day and another D D I S mm -hmm. interview. Um, 
But one of these kids, and he was a kid, is a Russian submariner. And he and I, it was one of the most surreal episodes of my life. He and I sit in my office for like four hours just talking about submarines. And he was much younger than me, obviously. And he's, he was still convinced to, to that day that, you know, we sank Kursk. And it was our fault. And he was still a little bitter about that. Um, It'd be interesting to know what kind of information he was getting internally too. Yeah. You know. But it was, uh, it was a surreal moment for me because here was this kid that five years before, if someone had said man battle stations missile for strategic launch, spin up all missiles or missiles three, six, and nine as a battle stations missile supervisor, I would have done it. Mm-hmm. And when me the, too. Me and too. when the CEO said you have permission to fire, I would have pushed denote one or denote three, and we would have been on our way. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't even have thought about it. That's the weird part to me, Eric. I wouldn't even it wouldn't even have been a struggle in my mind. It, it I, I it's weird to me now because I look at myself now, you know, I was 24, 25 years old. And I, now I'm 60. I look at it then and go, well, was I was I really thinking? But I know that back then I would have I wouldn't even have hesitated. But that's why I was there is because the Navy knew I wouldn't hesitate. They knew I would have carried out the orders as directed. I well, I don't know that I would do it today. I don't I don't know that no, I could. I, there's no way I'd do it today. <laughs> But you know, when you're younger, you're not so much politically engaged. You got other things to to think about, like talking about crazy stores. You know, like but I, was, talking I was. Watch. Politically engaged. I was. <laughs> well, yeah, politically well you're engaged. weird. I was very I was vehemently <laughs> anti-communist, and via, and with yeah. that, vehemently anti-Russian. But here's this kid sitting in my office, and I'm realizing that, you know, if I'd have had a if I'd have had a son with my very first girlfriend when I was just 18 years old, this could be my son, mm-hmm. and it was a weird experience to me in so many ways, but it was a good experience in realizing that people are people, people are people. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, we've, we've said this for years and that is submariners are not the enemy. The submarine Mm -hmm. itself might be the enemy, but the people inside really aren't. They're the, they're the competition, but it's hard for me to think of them as enemy. But how long is it with the exception of Vietnam and uh, well, the recent war too, but you know, the recent war is interesting too, because it, it shows the change of dynamic I'm getting ready to speak to. But before, you know, the recent ongoing 20 year war we've been in, involved in with, you know, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, I mean, it's it good. But it's been 55 years since World War II. And back then we, we talked about this too, you know, it, World War II vets were not getting over Germans very well. <laughs> And they didn't get over the Japanese people. We we talked about how, you know, if you owned a Japanese car, I mean, you'd be hunted down, you know, especially if you're around Detroit. That wasn't a good thing. You know, and that, but that was because of the fighting. So those people, you know, there was hate there, but it's been a long time. And the interesting dynamic with the recent war is we have veterans uh, that have started companies, Black Rifle being one of them. I mean, they're employing people from Afghanistan, people they've. They fought side by side, fighting other people from Afghanistan. You know, it'd be the Taliban and stuff. So, so now we, like you said, we were talking about now we have all these uh, power broker political movement to get us engaged in another dumb war that there's no need to to get into. Our, you know, and with the connectivity of the internet and way people can talk to each other so quickly and how information passes off. Because before when they had a war, you're like, the bad guys are over there. You need to sign up right now and let's go to war. I think I'd be able to pull that off, you know, if, if this thing lights off. Well, and uh, there's a couple of considerations there. Um, most wars, people believe that they're going to be quick. The Civil War, both sides believed that it would be over within 90 days. World War I, right. both sides' plans were to be in each other's capitals within, within 90 days. World War II, I don't know that they had that plan, but I know Hitler believed in the Blitzkrieg and believed in the idea that we could end this very quickly and then negotiate. Japan's whole plan was to establish their defensive perimeter and then negotiate. It would be over quickly. Is war today, particularly war between major powers, not not the United States versus Iraq, not USSR versus Afghanistan, not China versus Taiwan, are major 
superpower to superpower conflicts. Should we be planning for a long war or a short war? Right. And should we, I mean, I almost look at it as like they're getting each other on. Should we even be kidding about it? No. I mean, because is it going to be, you know, you're seeing how, how, how long is it? You know, they thought it was going to be a short war and a long war. Well, this could be a very short war because everybody has a nuclear weapon now. Could be. And, it could be a very short war, but it could also be a very long war. I mean, consider the, consider in very broad terms here, and I'm not going to get anything classified, the, the nuclear postures of the countries involved here. The United States, our nuclear defense forces are deterrent in nature. We say, <laughs> again, we say that say, they are not yeah. first strike. The Chinese have made it very clear throughout most of their history that their entire, I, I read today they only have 260 warheads total. Mm -hmm. And their entire posture is retaliatory. In other words, we won't use them unless you use them on us first. Now, who knows what the Russians are thinking? Who knows what St Stalin, Putin is thinking? Mm -hmm. Who knows what's going through their head? But these are people who are ready to roll tanks through Ukraine over, I mean, how many people actually know why they're willing to do this? Right. That's that's a big question. And I don't think and, I'm... And, and I've read off and on that there's a lot of people in Ukraine who wouldn't mind being part of Russia again, that's, for whatever reason. And that's <laughs> part of the problem, is it? Remember, Ukraine is a weird dynamic. Ukraine, when the Nazis invaded in 1941, welcomed the Nazis. They were excited about the Nazis to get rid of the Russians and the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when the Soviets came back, they weren't necessarily very happy about it. They were glad to be rid of the Nazis, but, but it wasn't a good time for them. You, you've got the whole issue with Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is, uh, boy, what a mess that place is. And yet there's so much Soviet, and I'm sorry, I keep saying Soviet, but Russian. These are all former countries. satellite countries right. of uh, the Soviet Union. Kazakhstan yeah. was the last Soviet Republic to break away in 91. They were the last one to do it. And. To this day, there, there's a belief that they shouldn't have done it because Kazakhstan is traditionally mm -hmm. part of Russia, traditionally, much like Crimea is traditionally part of Russia. But they, Kazakhstan is the source of Soviet uranium. It's also where their space program is located. The entire Soviet space program Isn't that is interesting? located yeah. in <laughs> Kazakhstan. It's like Kazakhstan might be its own independent country. But it's kind of like for us, it's kind of like Puerto Rico and Guam, their territories. I mean, all right. yeah, they're American citizens and all that. They're independent. But when they need to be, you know, they're, they're right back at the door going, hey, we're part of you. Um, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, much the same way. And they've already they've already sent the troops into Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And they're just waiting for the provocation on Ukraine, which is ostensibly is about NATO. Russia doesn't want NATO, Ukraine joining NATO. Because this was this would be a direct threat to their security. Again, irrational people say irrational things and do ira and start irrational wars. NATO's never started a war that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So why would Russia think that they're going to? It's, a, it's more about Russian hegemony and controlling energy to the western part of Europe. And then you got the Germans involved because the Germans want the energy and they're willing to dance with the devil Putin to get it. But you got the other countries that are like, hey, wait a minute, this, those are bad people. They, they do bad things. Why, why are you sucking? Ton, up? Tons and tons of variables. But meanwhile, like you're saying, we just got a bunch of young men out there. And some of the and best women. equipment, I believe, and, and young women, women yeah, out, out on our submarines. And you're cut off, except for, you know, uh, message traffic, which has been screened whether it goes out to you. You can remember that. You know, we never knew the news. I think they could have lied to us about the sports scores for you sports fans out there. And anyway, who who won the Super Bowl? You know, you would. It, it could have done that if they wanted to, because it wasn't like you're getting magazines and newspapers off of your local Seven Eleven underwater or anything. But you know, got a lot of people just out there blind, and they're just doing their job what they were highly trained to do. And like you, like we said, you know, when we pushed a button, you know, absolutely, because that's what we were trained to do. That's what we were screened to do, and that's what is expected. And uh, that's what—that's the same posture I would assume the submarine force has today. I would assume so. And of course, now we have the added element of SSGNs on top of that, and 
first strike capabilities for non-nuclear first strike capability. I mean, there's so many variables and so many uh, so many things going on here, so many moving parts. I mean, you think about war in Ukraine, what's the submarine fleet going to do? Right. Well, there's a lot of submarine fleet can do, particularly our submarine fleet. I don't know. I don't know if Australia's submarine fleet could be mm-hmm. or Canada's, but ours could certainly be a big part of that. And I mean, I really like that. That whole SSGN. I mean, I, I was pro from a sorry. When you think about all the Tomahawk cruise missiles you put on, on a, on a high class submarine as seven Tomahawks per missile tube, that's a lot of whoop ass going out there for somebody I can give one boat can give somebody a really bad day. Heck can give a small country a bad day. <laughs> When uh, back in the day, when when uh, Kim Jong Un was rattling his saber and making all his comments about what he's going to do, and USS Michigan, my beloved USS Michigan, mm-hmm. which is no longer the SSBN that it was when I was there, pops up in Pusan, <laughs> pulls into Pusan, and, says, and and at the time I remember thinking to myself, and I actually said this on the air on the radio, it was uh, USS Michigan versus North Korea, who you got? Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> And just one, one boat. We're good. We got this. <laughs> it's all we Not need. a problem. That's all we need. Just that one. <laughs> don't need anything else. No backup. We got this. No problem. But at the same time, I don't want to lose track of the fact that this is this is very dangerous. It's very it's a deadly game, folks. Mm-hmm. And here's the part that nobody wants to hear. Yeah. If this thing devolves into a war. We're going to lose people. Yeah. And we're going to lose people in a way that we haven't seen in a long time, not since World War II. I mean, what is the total number of people we've lost in the, the 20-year mess we've been into? You know, you know that number right offhand? Off, offhand, no, but I know it's less than 10,000. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, five to 10,000. Keep, keep in mind that in 30 minutes at the Battle of Cold Harbor, 10,000 dead mm-hmm. on the Union side. That's the Battle of Verdun, 1.6 million people. Mm-hmm dead gone most of them never found they just got their right. bodies just ground into the dirt the, the flanders the same thing world war ii we had how many men die on omaha beach in just a few hours are people uh, are, are are they ready to handle that i mean it seems like a lot of people just go mindlessly day by day you see them walking around with just their cell phones in their face i mean we're lucky more people don't get killed just walking out in the street because they don't even look up anymore as a society, I mean, no, we're not ready for this. I don't think I don't think we're ready for that kind of loss. But no. here's what's going to happen, Eric. Now, this is this is Dave's prediction. It may not happen, but this is what I see happening, which is that they have to, like in World War One with Lord Kitchener and your country needs you, and Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam wants you. Right. There's going to have to be a great patriotic drive to get the American people and you, you'll want, you'll see it on the news. You'll see it in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. You'll see this whole thing about how Russia, presumably since they'll be the opponent right, is, is evil and how we have to stand up for democracy and how we have to stand up for, for, uh, you know, security and safety and against tyranny and all those kinds of things. But remember all of that will happen when it's already been decided that we're going to go to war right now today that that hasn't been clearly decided yet. And so you're not seeing that yet. And so and for those, yeah, for those of you who think we're joking about how serious things are, I saw just before we came on the show today a Twitter feed from the army. They're offering fifty thousand dollars sign on bonuses for a six year commitment. So I mean, they say you know, this a certain qualification, obviously, but still, I mean, would you go back if the Navy called you and said, Hey, I need a missile yeah. missile tech? Not this time. I can't. I just can't, but because I'm I'm older, wiser, not as wise, wise as the old powerful Dave Bowman here, but I mean I'm I'm wiser, and I I know the games that the local politics, you know, uh, national politics and world stage politics. It's just you know, you you, you of course you based on what side you want to play and what you read, you know, you pick sides obviously, but it's just it's so confusing. You don't know who to believe, and and I'm not willing to tell my children, hey, you need to join up. Right now, get that fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, and go against Russia, or go against China, or whoever the bad guy is. And plus, you know, with the media since the last election, I mean, I saw something about CNN's like ninety percent of their their uh, you know their what do you call it their fellowship, their people watch them, I mean, gone. So even if a war happens, 
who are they going to go out to and say, hey, we got to we got to go against Russia right now? Who, who are they going to talk to? Nobody pays attention to the, even. Well, I definitely know uh, CNN and MSNBC and Fox News numbers is not even where it used to be. So how, how are they going to well, get that information out there that there's bad guys and we got to go get the boog- boogeyman? You scare people. You get them involved. Wasn't it this day? I think this was the day, January 12th, 1991. When Congress voted on the authorization for use of military force in Iraq, or sorry, yeah, Iraq, mm-hmm. and I, that that day stands out in my mind. You know why? Because I happened to be in Washington D.C. that day. I happened to be on patrol. I wasn't. I was stationed at Dan Beck <laughs> as an instructor, but but at the, for for reasons that I'm not going to go into here, my first wife, I was in Washington <laughs> D.C. that day, and yeah. I was. I was near the Capitol listening to it on the radio. So yeah, they, they will generate that interest as they need to. They, the, the playbook's been done. The, the, mm. There's no, there's no mystery here as to how you get people fired up for this. The question is whether or not, if you don't think it's logical now, and maybe you do, maybe you think we need to go to war for Ukraine right now. And that's fine. If you think that I don't happen to agree, but if you think that that's fine, I'm not going to argue with it. But you, if you don't think it's logical now, What's going to change when the tanks roll across the border into Ukraine? Is What's it going to change specific? with what with years and years of classified weapon systems on all sides that will get involved? Have not have not even because you don't you wait for you wait till the last minute before you break out the good stuff. And what's that going to be? We saw during the Persian Gulf War one, you know, the the the, the amount of because t- we didn't even know we had that precision where we can put put a missile right down a you know a, I don't know a ten inch pipe and got up a building. It was amazing. We were watching it live on CNN. We're like, this is crazy technology. That was that's Patriot 30 missiles. years ago. Yeah. Think of what we got now. We, we all knew we had Patriot missiles, but we didn't know what they did. Yeah. And it was like, oh, that's what those things do. That's and goes cool. there. Are you willing to see new technology you've ever seen before? And you're willing to see a lot of a lot of people disappear really quickly because of it. Yep. And that's what's going to happen. And that's what scares me. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't want to get too depressing. So that's uh, that's what we're going to Maybe this at. show needs because normally we're kind of jovial and joking around but you know hey i think i think it's a good cap talking about you know we, we've talked about uss connecticut since it happened talking about that and san francisco is just a good thing because there's more information about it and the survivability of, of, of the silent service over the years and you know what a heritage we've had a hundred hundred plus years on now and i think i think the silent service will be ready as it's always been ready and they're going to do their part but that means rather said, not do it. I'd rather not do it because that's. You know, I don't think we want to go that route. But I, b- I believe in our navy, and I believe in our boys out there, and I and I believe in our NATO, NATO allies too. Just don't know a lot of. I know I got Russians and stuff on on the Facebook group, but it's just other than some of the people I do talk to a little bit. I don't know, and to do that. How, do, you know, because of the internet and way everybody talks, do they really want to go to it? The people I'm talking about, the sailors. Mm-hmm. That would so, be do they really want to go to war. <laughs> that would be interesting to hear from some of you folks on the Facebook page that are not American. What? what right. Well, how are you reading this? What are you seeing? Because I'm, I'm gonna, on the other side. Yeah. Yes. Please gonna, go on the Facebook group. And maybe we'll post a show and it'll be pinned to the top. Yeah. yeah. Go, everybody on both sides, you know, just you don't have to say any particulars about what your Navy's doing. Just saying, how do you feel about going to war with all these different sides? You know, do you really think it's your war? Yeah. To be fought. So. Good stuff. Those are the interesting things. Uh, one last thing about. I want to drop. Um, I don't know if you follow the page. If you don't follow the page, the subvet, facebook.com slash groups slash the subvet. You should be following it. And if you do, you saw a posting there a couple of days ago from Dan Gibson, who goes by the name Dang Ibsen. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> off for, for a while. Uh, he has written a book called Spook Writer. It's a fiction book. And it is available on sale right now on, on, on Amazon Prime. So he's a uh, member of the group there. So if you want to support Dan, then yeah. And you know how I figured out what, cause I couldn't figure out for months, I couldn't figure out this dang Ibsen thing. And then I saw his book and his book is by Dan Gibson. And I went, you son of a, <laughs> Holy I, saw, I, I kind of <laughs> figured that's what it was, but I didn't know. <laughs> Moved the letter <laughs> over. And it's sure. Kind of funny. I said, well, that would make sense. It was Dan Gibson. So, so anyway, if you want well, to support I mean, him, yeah. it's not an expensive book, even if you have to pay for the whole thing, right. It's available on Kindle and, if you have Amazon read, what is it? At Kindle Unlimited, it's free. But if you don't, right. fork over a couple of bucks and read it. 
Yeah, Let we us talked know about you... the bubble hood, bubble heads book too. Yep, you can get that one. So you get. Uh, I uh, I would like to if you're a submarine writer, give us a drop us an email. My email is dolphin dave at slipperyfish dot com. Mine's Eric at the subbed dot com. Or you and can no. Uh, what well, I was going to say, not only drop us a line, let's get you on the show. Right. That's I mean, what I was going to say. We, we want to get some people on here. Yeah. Yeah. Drop me a voicemail, 360-930-9556. We're in your email. Let's get you on the show. Let's talk about your book. Let's promote it. Let's, uh, let's get you some sales. If we and can. if you have any comments about today's show, please call that number again. Can you say it, dude? No, you had to ask me that, didn't you? I just said <laughs> 360-930-9556. You can leave your comments on, on that line. I think it gives you a good I don't know, three minutes to three, three minutes, minutes to kind of kind of talk about what you want to say. And hey, leave us a leave us a comment. And we might use it on the next show, or we might, you know use them for like recaps if we get enough. Of them. And and I think a, that would be fun too. As a professional radio guy, I can tell you if you can't say what you got to say in three minutes, you didn't really think about what. You yeah, can, three minutes is longer than you think it is. And so. if you have to call back, if you got to keep going, you can. And just keep calling back, leave a message, say, hey, this is part two of the message. Cool. So, all right, Dave. All right, man. Very uh, good. Uh, secure from Battle Station's missile. Set condition to SQ. And hopefully we don't have to do one SQ. Anyways, <laughs> I hope you have a, a good rest of the week, Dave. So, and you as well. We'll see you. See you next week.